So as mentioned, my name is uh, Julie Gill. I'm uh, an oncologist by trade, um, and I've been active in, in this field for about 20 years. Um, and I'm also working a lot in translational medicine. Um, so I would call myself a, a translational scientist oncologist. So I do both lab work. We have an animal facility where we can carry out studies. And then we have an oncology center at the University of Copenhagen, uh, Hallow Hospital, where I work. Today I'm going to talk to you, of course, about electrochemotherapy. I'm going <coughs> to try to illustrate some of the, um, some more of the science behind and why we do what we do. I'm going to talk to you about electrochemotherapy in daily practice because, for my experience anyway, is that um, you do you do all the nice science and you get all the everything organized, but actually doing things on a daily basis in a practical way uh, is really important. Um, and uh, I, I would be glad to share my experiences with you. Uh, of course, you'll be interested to hear some more of the future perspectives about electrochemotherapy, including the use for internal tumors. Uh, as Joy mentioned previously, uh, we started to work with calcium as an alternative to bleomycin. Um, and this may come as a surprise, it did to us as well, because we thought it was an idea, we didn't really think it would be would work all that well, but it did work all that well, so now we're really working hard on it. And I'd be happy to share our data uh, with you around it. And then finally, we've been using uh, a d um, electroporation for gene delivery. And I think this will be very important uh, in the future, uh, not least for vaccinations, but uh, but I think it could also be very interesting in oncology practice. So more about electrochemotherapy. So uh, I'm just going to show you this slide, um, <coughs> and I guess you are familiar with it, but I'll, it'll be nice for reflecting on later on. So we have in uh, numeral one, we have the intact cell with a lot of calcium outside, a lot of sodium outside, and um, then we permeabilize the cell, we get influx of calcium, we get influx of sodium, and ATP is lost directly through the permeabilized membrane, as is uh, potassium. And then when the cell uh, closes the membrane again, under the use of ATP, it, uh, it gets re-equilibrates to get the homeostasis back online. That's what you see in three, with a, a cell that's kind of getting uh, back on its feet again and going back to normal. Or you can have irreversible electroporation, which some people are also working with, where you put so much, uh, where the voltage is so high that you actually get a level of permeabilization that means the cell is not able to reseal before it's lost all its energy and uh, it dies from the electrical current alone. When we talk about reversible electroporation, we use it for two things. We deliver smaller molecules, such as chemotherapy. What you see here, um, what you see here on, on this slide uh, is a cell uh, where you have you are exerting an electric field on some of the cell. Uh, you will have the most degree of permeabilization towards the positive electrode because you have a negative cell interior, and you will also have um, uh, some degree of permeabilization towards the negative electrode. For small molecules, you see the influx here in this uh, part of the cell. <coughs> Uh, for DNA, you see a different picture because DNA is too large to just flow into the cell through a small permeabilization. So DNA, DNA is actually pushed, pushed by an electrophoretic effect, and therefore we see that DNA is going from minus to plus because it's a negative molecule, so it'll actually be pushed uh, towards the uh, positive electrode. We use some different uh, pulses that are optimized for the different molecules we want to deliver. If we want to deliver small molecules, then eight high voltage pulses, as we're using now, is uh, an excellent way of delivering a good load of small molecules, such as chemotherapy. If we're using DNA, we use a high voltage and a low voltage pulse uh, to get the DNA inside by an electrophoretic effect. And as you know, the first study in electrochemotherapy uh, was published in 1993, and in 2013 we had the NICE approval uh, which here in the UK and also in the, in the rest of Europe has been uh, very important due to the, um, the, 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 the very um, the, the, the good process that NICE is having about looking through all the data and involving uh, experts. 
So uh, what we know, and as was what you've seen also in the previous uh, presentations, is that electrochemotherapy works well. Um, this is a melanoma patient where you have to the left before treatment and then to the in the middle two weeks after, and then six months later without any signs of recurrence. A question that I've um, asked myself along the years is really why it is working so well and why the normal tissue is so well preserved. So if you look at this area here, uh, you'll see that this patient was treated with IV bleomycin and the hexagonal electrodes, and of course we treated with a margin. And you can see in the normal uh, skin, you will see these uh, little marks where the needles were. Uh, and then you see complete necrosis of the tumor. And uh, this is quite fascinating, and we see it over and over again. Um, this is just another picture from one of the <coughs> studies from Declan Soden's group, uh, where you have a basal cell carcinoma uh, to the left, and then a nice resolution uh, to the right. So um, what we know about uh, the drugs we're using, we're using bleomycin, which has a very high increase in the cytotoxicity when cell access is allowed. So these are different drugs we uh, know from oncology. I would add different old drugs because there's a lot new more uh, coming in now. Um, so uh, of course, if you, if you use a lipophilic drug like Don Rubicin or etoposide, it's not going to matter whether you punch holes in the cell or not. They are going to go over the membrane. Doxorubicin is an amphiphilic, so <coughs> it, some people find a difference, some people find no difference. Uh, for the hydrophilic drugs such as cisplatin, carboplatin, uh, and bleomycin, there is a clear difference uh, for cisplatin, a little bit lower than for bleomycin. And I think you'll see the reason also that we're using bleomycin is you have this very large increase of the cytotoxic uh, effect. An interesting <coughs> paper that just uh, um, I became aware of now is that actually on bleomycin, which is a very complex molecule, there's a sugar group. And some chemists uh, in the US were working with trying to cut off the sugar group and seeing what happens. And it seems actually that bleomycin is uh, preferentially uh, taken up by, or, uh, is, is, uh, if, if you have malignant cells um, and normal cells, you will find that the malignant cells tend to absorb the uh, bleomycin more than the normal cells do. And uh, they try to find out whether this uh, was caused by this sugar uh, residue which is on the bleomycin, and they could cut off the sugar and then they found that there was no selectivity towards the malignant cells. So it seems like just with, like with PET scans, um, uh, bleomycin is acting um, uh, also uh, by, uh, by having this uh, um, uh, sugar chain on it so that the malignant cells will uh, prefer preferably attract it. We also have something called the vascular lock. This is very important. It means it says that tumor vessels are particularly sensitive both to the electroporation and to the electrochemotherapy. So we know that tumor vessels are, uh, and tumor endothelial cells also have this preference for sugary substances. And this has also been shown uh, by these chemists that if you cut off the sugar, also the tumor uh, endothelial cells will not take up as much bleomycin. Um, so, and, and furthermore, we know that electroporation, uh, what happens in tumor vessels is you have these tortuous tumor vessels going to the, through the tumor, there's a high interstitial pressure, and when you electroporate, what happens is that the tumor vessel collapses, and you have the high interstitial pressure, so that it's actually very difficult for the tumor vessel to reestablish uh, the flow uh, uh, through the vessel. And we see this when we're working that the uh, tumor uh, vessel bed actually collapses uh, when we're working. So we can see that the tumor turns pale, bluish, where we've applied uh, the pulses. Uh, another recent finding, and this is a study that we're doing together with a team in Atlanta, is we looked at membrane repair capability in malignant and normal cells. And this was an accidental collaboration uh, that these people were working on membrane repair. And I, I s said, hey, that would be really interesting for 
legs operation because we need to explain uh, why this is working so much better in the tumor cells than in the normal cells. And actually, uh, this study showed, and you will be able to see here, the black line on the bottom is a normal cell, and all the others are uh, malignant cells, and there is a uh, significant difference in their ability to repair their membrane. This, these are membrane holes caused by laser operation, so uh, the, the, the holes are all similar in all the cells, but the repair uh, is much faster in the normal cells than in the malignant cells. And we are hoping <coughs> to s publish this work, uh, hopefully within a few weeks. <coughs> so uh, what we know now is that there could be many reasons uh, that there is this uh, strong difference between the effect on normal and uh, malignant cells. And um, the, the, di the, the impact on malignant cells may also explain why it's working on, so to speak, everything. Uh, as we get high numbers of patients uh, with data, uh, in we have a common uh, data registry where we have now, I believe, over 700 patients. So it starts to become possible to do across the board uh, comparisons between the tumor histologies. And I think we will be finding some small differences. Uh, it looks like basocellular carcinoma is going to be uh, the easiest to treat and malignant melanoma may be a little bit harder and the other ones in the middle, but all of them are really in a very high uh, percentage of uh, complete responses. So we would be expecting in the 80 to 90 percent uh, uh, range um, concerning responses and uh, for the complete responses it will be a little bit depending on tumor size because for the cutaneous lesions uh, to heal, uh, the, 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 the large tumors take a terrible amount of time to heal. <coughs> this is just uh, to point out the uh, uh, meta-analysis that was done in the Journal of Clinical Oncology uh, in 14, comparing different types of uh, treatments for cutaneous lesions, uh, which um, it, there are no randomized trials here, but electrochemotherapy <coughs> came favorably. <coughs> I want to talk also very briefly about fields and effects. Uh, so there, there's a whole bunch of uh, literature about this, but clearly uh, the type of electrodes that we use matter. It was mentioned previously that um, the linear uh, row uh, electrodes uh, are very good for the um, uh, to avoid pigmentation. Uh, they're nice to use in the facial area because they leave less scarring. Um, and especially also for, for using it, for when you're using intratumoral, I would always use a linear electrodes. They have an applied voltage of 400 volts, and the hexagonal has one of 790 mm. volts, so almost double. Uh, so basically, for me, the choice is very simple. You use a linear array electrode because you get a nicer field distribution and a lower applied voltage, unless the tumor is too large, and uh, you wouldn't be able to finish uh, the week you started treating uh, if you if you didn't use a larger electrode. So um, we've it's been shown now that electrochemotherapy works for small tumors. It's been abundantly shown. There's been very many uh, phase two studies and this is also the basis for the NICE approval. When we found this out, we wanted to know would it work for large tumors? And the, the, the people we were particularly thinking of were the people with breast cancer recurrences because uh, this is a, a significant clinical problem. So we did a study, a phase two study on electrochemotherapy of large chest wall recurrences. And um, I'm just gonna show you one of the uh, patients um, that we treated here. So these are uh, the available patients and in a water pl waterfall plot, uh, the responses after one treatment. And you can see that about a third of them had more than 50% tumor reduction after one treatment. And in this case, uh, this was a 64-year-old woman with chest wall recurrence of breast cancer who had had uh, bilateral surgery, radiotherapy actually twice, so irradiation and then later re-irradiation, and four different types of chemotherapy. Um, and you can see here the the images on the left before treatment and on the right after two treatments. 
um, where you see nice resolution both for the skin photo photographs, for the CT scans and for the uh, PET uh, images. And for me, this can be a, a, a very important um, treatment for these patients, uh, both because uh, you get the tumor resolution, but with it also the patient has a much reduced <coughs> uh, need of bandage changes and a much better um, uh, feeling about uh, not having a, uh, an uncontrollable growth right in the mirror uh, every morning. Um, and of course, uh, if it's working in large tumors, the next question is, does it have to be in the skin? And um, there's a number of groups now working in different directions. Uh, uh, in head and neck cancer, uh, we have a strong team in Pavia, and also we are working with head and neck cancer, and uh, there's also head and neck oncologists here in, in the UK working uh, with it. Um, we're seeing some excellent responses. Uh, in fact, as an oncologist, I would say that if this had been a drug, uh, there would be some company over enthusiastic. Um, and it's a once only treatment. Um, we should definitely, I think, both compare it with, uh, um, with chemotherapy, with a crossover study, and I think combining it with immunotherapy would also be uh, an obvious choice. Um, I'm going to show you also a few pictures of endoscopic use uh, that we're doing together with the Cork Cancer Center in Ireland. Um, and this is for colorectal cancers. And then uh, I would mention that people are working on liver metastasis, uh, that's particular, particularly out of Slovenia. Interesting data are coming on the treatment of bone metastasis, and that's from Italy. Also, there's a center in Naples doing pancreatic cancer and already published uh, several uh, studies. And I'm going to show you an expandable electrode for internal use. We used it for brain metastasis, but I'm happy to say that this expandable electrode uh, is now um, planned to be produced also for use in, in other regions like, uh, like the head and neck. And this is the image of the expandable electrode that you can have a single insertion and then you can expand uh, the probe out from there, allowing it to be used uh, through burr holes or uh, through incisions. This is from a cancer research paper in 11, um, in a rat brain model uh, where you have a tumor uh, in the rat brain treated either by pulses only on the top where you have expansion of the tumor or by electrochemotherapy chemotherapy where you have a nice resolution. And this is say an image from the endoscopic treatment. We're just going to write up this manuscript now together with the uh, Cork team who uh, invented the electrode. Here you see on the top right the electrode, uh, which is a kind of a suction vacuum electrode. And here uh, you see insertion of the electrode and the tumor after it's been treated. And you can see this pale bluish color, which is typical because of the vascular lock uh, after treatment. And this is a uh, some imagery showing uh, a response. I want to just share with you a little bit about how we do things in daily clinical practice. So uh, I'm an oncologist, as mentioned, because I have a tradition of, of bringing this, uh, this treatment around and so on. I've continued to treat patients at, at uh, my oncology center. Uh, so if it's small, few tumors, uh, what we do is um, we apply some Emla cream, uh, so this anesthetic cream, an hour before they get the local anesthetic, and this is particularly for the breast cancer patients with previous surgery, previous irradiation, who have hypersensitive skin. There's no reason not to, uh, to give them this cream an hour before because it alleviates the problem with, with the local anesthetic. Then we put the local anesthetic, we inject bleomycin locally, we use row needle electrode, the patient goes home, that's it. We don't use any uh, tranquilizers or anything. It's a very, very simple procedure. Um, the whole procedure takes usually 20 to 30 minutes. And I'm happy to say we are seeing a little more of the small few tumors. Our problem has been that the patients have only been referred to us if nobody had any idea what to do. And this meant that we was, we've been seeing these terrible, terrible tumors, which of course we will still treat, but I'm hoping that more of my colleagues will come to think of related to chemotherapy uh, a little bit earlier in the course because, of course, it's easier to treat them when they're small. 
for the large tumors, uh, what we found was, uh, you know, when we, was doing, we were doing this uh, phase two study on, on breast cancer, um, we were standing there as oncologists in the operating theater, and we were just thinking, oh, this looks big. <laughs> and um, we found out that one of the conclusions <coughs> of this study on the large tumors that we should be working uh, with the surgeons relevant for the, uh, for the area. So for the uh, uh, cutaneous tumors, we have an excellent collaboration with our plastic surgeons. For the head and neck tumors, it's the head and neck surgeons. For the uh, brain metastasis study, it was the neurosurgeons and so on. And I think this is uh, really the take home message that it's a collaborative thing and you should be working with a surgeon that knows where, uh, mm. knows, that, that knows the region. Um, I think this is important for the large tumors. Uh, the way we do it for the large tumors is uh, we find that for the oncologist perspective, it's important that the patient gets treated as patient number one on the surgical plan in order for us to participate because this means that we can go back and then continue with our, uh, with our schedule. We know that it will be the first patient. And uh, for us, it's Monday morning. And then on the Tuesday before, which is just out of practical reasons, we do a whole thing with the patient sees the plastic surgeon, sees the oncologist, sees the anesthesiologist, does the blood chemistry, everything's ready. And then they come in uh, Monday morning at eight for the, for the procedure. And the next day, we have a consultation by the oncologist. And we found this to be very useful because these are often complicated oncology patients. The breast cancer patients, for example, often have liver, bone metastasis, many other issues. And some of the plastic surgeons are just not used to handling these, uh, these very complex uh, things. And um, so, so for us, it's been very good that we kind of follow up on the whole thing uh, the day after the procedure and also make contact to the home nurse and uh, to the oncologist that the patient uh, belongs to, so to say. Uh, sometimes we will be inserting electrochemotherapy into a chemotherapy schedule, uh, like if you have a rapidly progressing tumor in the skin but you have control of metastasis elsewhere, we'll actually insert electrochemotherapy into the regimen. I'd be happy to answer more questions if you have uh, in the breaks. Um, as mentioned, uh, there's no reason not to share experience, um, so please feel free. I'll just continue to talk a little bit about calcium electroporation. And this was a, um, we were working on gene therapy actually, and we wanted a way to stop gene therapy, and we found that um, muscle that we were working with for the gene therapy was very sensitive to calcium. So we injected calcium and electroporated and could stop the gene expression. And then somebody said, why don't we use it for tumor cells? And I was thinking, yeah, why well, don't we so many things that I don't have time to do? Uh, so I wrote it down mm -hmm. on a, uh, I wrote it down on a note and then uh, one day a, a student came by and wanted a project and I told her, you know, this is, this is frontline research and you will have to be very independent to work here. And she looked at me and said, yeah. And uh, we started, and um, these were the first results she came with, uh, which was, um, so you see in the blue, you see three different cell lines, uh, and blue is without electroporation, just increasing doses of calcium, and red is with electroporation. So in these three very different cell lines, you have uh, a very strong effect of calcium electroporation. Um, so we felt that we needed to confirm that in vivo. And in this study, which is with nude mice with a human tumor that's fluorescent, you see that there is a, a, a very strong effect on tumor volume and also on the intensity of the fluorescence. And this paper was out in Cancer Research in 2012. We also looked at the mechanism behind. First, we looked at the uh, histology and we found uh, really pan necrosis uh, in the tumors treated and uh, in order to try to understand what was going on we looked at the ATP also and we found that if you do electroporation by itself you actually have a drop in ATP because it needs to restore the uh, homeostasis uh, but it bounces back up <coughs> by four hours um, but if you do calcium electroporation you nullify basically the ATP and it doesn't jump back up and this is also done at, at later timescales, and it, it doesn't come back. 
So uh, basically what we're doing is we're taking out the battery of the tumor cells. So this is what we think we're, is happening. We do membrane permeabilization. We have calcium influx, uh, ATP efflux. We also lose potassium and we gain sodium. And there's an increased ATP consumption, in particularly the uh, calcium uh, membrane ATPase, which can pump out calcium and which is immediately triggered, is very ATP hungry, so to say. So it is spending a lot of ATP. And then also other pumps like the sodium potassium ex exchange is also using ATP. What the cell will also do is try to get rid of the excess calcium by putting it into the mitochondria. But what can happen then is that you, you actually destroy the mitochondrion. And then you're going to also lose the ATP production capability. And then there will be some other cellular effects as well that lead to necrosis. We asked ourselves some important questions. Of course, we tried this in one tumor. Does it work mm -hmm. in all tumors? I mean, is it like bleomycin that works for everything? And uh, if it works for everything, uh, how much damage does it do to normal tissue? And uh, we looked at the dose and the concentration. Uh, and also, of course, we uh, were eager to try this uh, in patients. And regarding trying it in patient, uh, calcium is actually available, so we didn't have to wait. We could just design the study. So um, first of all, does it work in different tumors? Yeah, it does. We tried it in human colon cancer, breast cancer, bladder cancer and the lung cancer nude mice, and we are uh, submitting this publication shortly. Um, we looked at the damage to normal tissue, and we investigated in tumor versus skin and muscle in mice, and this publication is also being submitted shortly. And I would add that we also looked at the consum calcium content, uh, and it seems that the normal tissues are able to rid themselves of the uh, internalized calcium, whereas the tumor cells are not. Um, we looked at dose and concentration, um, also investigated in the murine system, and uh, we have still more work to do in particular in the patients, but I'd like to discuss that. And then finally, I think what you're interested in is, does it work in patients? Uh, we did a study on keloid tumors, as uh, previously discussed, uh, <coughs> where you want to use um, um, uh, mito, uh, mutagenic uh, treatments for um, uh, patients that don't have cancer. So uh, we're always concerned about giving them radiotherapy. We're also concerned about giving them chemotherapy. Uh, and then we did a randomized double-blinded clinical trial of cutaneous metastasis. I don't think I will ever later in my career jump directly from a murine study to a randomized double-blinded clinical trial. But we found out it was possible. Uh, so what we did for the uh, cutaneous tumors was we uh, measured the tumors on the patients. Uh, we told the pharmacy uh, the volumes of the tumors and they mixed syringes for us. And the syringes say calcium or bleomycin. So we as uh, treating physicians actually do not know whether the content is calcium or the content is bleomycin. And the patient doesn't know either. Uh, we do exactly uh, the same procedure. We put the local anesthesia, we inject the drug, we deliver the pulses and then we follow up uh, and measure. And um, as mentioned, we do local anesthesia. The calcium we volume we, inject, we chose to inject was a solution of 220 millimolar and then a volume corresponding to half of the tumor volume. What we feel is that 220 might be a little bit high. Uh, but we wanted to be sure that uh, we, when going into this study, uh, we had chosen a high dose so that the conclusion wouldn't, wouldn't be that we should have chosen a higher dose. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm guessing that it will be possible to actually reduce this somewhat. And then we use the linear array electrodes. And this is one of the patients treated with a follow-up. And um, actually, uh, what we see with, with, uh, with this is, uh, that we have a, a, a difference in the pigmentation degree so that the, the calcium-treated uh, tumors don't have uh, hyperpigmentation. And these are the preliminary results. Uh, so what we have here is a waterfall plot where calcium is red and bleomycin is blue. And you can see here that we have by far the most of the tumors uh, below the line and even at a, at a, a complete remission. 
The ones with the little stars are previously irradiated tumors, and we found that so we found that there was a distinct difference in the response probability depending on whether radiotherapy had been administered to the tumor before or not. And we believe this has something to do with the diffusion uh, in the tumor or possibly also the tumor biology since obviously it has recurred since the radiotherapy. Uh, we are also uh, just about to complete a trial on keloids. And for this trial, we, uh, had t we are going to treat eight patients and the seven are treated now. What we do is we treat half of a keloid. So we choose a keloid together with the patient and we say, okay, we're gonna treat half. So one half is treated, the other half is the control. And then uh, in order to keep the patients happy, we promised that after six months, we would be happy to treat the other half of the, f of the treated lesion and we would also be able to treat further lesions. And uh, by, far if, by far the majority, if not all the patients have actually chosen to have uh, uh, more lesions treated. The preliminary results uh, show response uh, particularly on lesion thickness. And it looks al actually a little bit like uh, what you were showing. Of course, this is still very early. Um, but but uh, just when you look at it clinically, it looks, it looks similar that you don't actually see a decrease in, in, in the, um, you don't see healing from the sides, but you see a reduction of the tumor mass, a reduction of the height. We're gonna follow the patients for two years um, my primary worry was that, uh, you know, what if, what if uh, calcium is a growth factor or something and we, we do this and the, the keloids grow, but that hasn't happened. Um, we see a reduction, uh, of course it's too early to say if the redux this reduction in thickness is going to hold uh, because we're not at the two year follow up yet. A little bit more about normal versus malignant tissue response. So. Uh, we were, of course, very concerned to understand if there would be uh, normal tissue damage uh, because calcium is, is not a cytotoxic drug, so we were feeling that possibly this would uh, be as toxic to the normal cells as the malignant cells. But this has definitely not been the case. I'm going to show you one study here just published uh, where we investigate calcium electroporation and, and uh, bleomycin electroporation in uh, spheroids, which are little tumor balls, tumor cell balls, or normal cell balls, uh, and you, the one to the uh, left upper corner over here, those are uh, the normal cells, and what you find there is that the pink is the calcium electroporation, so actually this, uh, this little spheroid of cells uh, stays the same, or even grows a little bit with the calcium electroporation. Whereas the three other ones are tumor cell lines um, of breast cancer, colon cancer, uh, bladder cancer. And in all cases, you see that the pink line just hits the floor uh, immediately. And this is uh, uh, the measurement of the tumors. And you can see for the normal cell line on top, you have the almost the same image, even if you do calcium electroporation. Whereas in the malignant uh, spheroid, they, they, they just kind of explode or implode, disappear. Um, so in conclusion, um, we know that calcium electroporation is highly effective, and we tested this in animal studies across different tumor models, uh, and it seems to be um, uh, across the board that there's a, a high efficacy. Uh, we know that it's effective in the preliminary clinical data uh, most of the patients by far in our study are breast cancer patients because we need them to be available for a six months follow up without changing treatments. And that's basically the description of your breast cancer patients on endocrine therapy, for example, uh, with a progression in, in the skin. Um, so, so therefore, it's hard for us to say much about uh, many different uh, malignancies, but my guess is that it would work also in other malignancies. And then we are testing it now, as mentioned, in cutaneous metastasis and keloids. And we found a significant difference between malignant and normal tissue. And uh, as mentioned, we are publishing these results. And now my PhD student will be defending next Friday. So I can't just show you all her data, 
uh, but it's it's coming out, and we think we can explain um, some of the reasons why there's this uh, strong difference. Um, so uh, out of this come some new questions. First of all, uh, we welcome an independent confirmatory clinical trial to the trial that we are just completing now. And I'm happy to say that uh, there is a dermatology group in uh, Hungary that have uh, submitted uh, the proposal we have or our protocol in English uh, so that it would be possible to use it and also we'll be looking for a confirmatory trial in keloids. Um, we need to uh, further investigate the dose. I think less calcium could be used. Um, we don't know what the actual limit of calcium injection into patients is. We have been very conservative uh, making sure that no patient would have an, I have an increase in uh, serum calcium as a result of this. I'm not sure we need to be all that conservative. Uh, and then I think we need to evaluate treating more than once so that if you feel that you are approaching the limit of what you can load a patient with in terms of calcium uh, during one treatment, you could actually treat them again. And it's always been this thing about related to chemotherapy that it's a once only treatment, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a given that it has to be. So um, I'm thinking that we need to be open about uh, that possibility. And then, of course, we will continue to further research into the mechanisms of action of uh, calcium electroporation, uh, which is a uh, really big uh, uh, field because calcium, as you know, is, is so um, ubiquitous, ubiquitously used in the cell for uh, signaling and is involved in so many processes. Finally, just a few words about gene therapy. Uh, so you can put uh, DNA into tumors and you'll get a uh, very brief expression of your transgene. Um, this, uh, this can be used, for example, for transferring uh, genes for cytokines. Um, as there's a study in, in, in the US that did this very nicely. You can use it to uh, transfer DNA into the skin, and I believe personally that uh, DNA vaccination is going to be the future. Uh, well, everybody in vaccination is saying that, so I guess I believe it too. <laughs> um, and then also that uh, electroporation is going to be used for this, uh, possibly with some small uh, applicators. Um, Gene electrotransfer to muscle is interesting because you just put the gene in the muscle and even though it's not integrated into the genome, it will still be continuously expressed. Um, and what happens when you get the DNA in is that it, it enters through the cell membrane and then it's actually transported to the nucleus uh, by mechanisms already in place in the cells and uh, then it will be expressed from there. This is just a picture from a study that we did in a, a European collaboration uh, using um, an integrin inhibitor, and this is for melanoma. And then uh, also I want to point out the study done in the US with interleukin-12, uh, where they had some very nice results, and they are continuing now in an expanded phase two. Finally, I would just like to show you kind of how fast things have evolved. Here, this is about electrochemotherapy of cutaneous tumors. Uh, so in the bottom there, you can see there's a little handmade electrode uh, with, uh, with little hypodermic needles and uh, two circuit boards that are glued together. This was uh, the first version of the uh, linear row electrode, and we used that for 18 months. Um, and they could, could be sterilized, and we had approval from the medical technical department and so on. Uh, but of course, it's, I have to say it's simpler um, to just order them. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we're happy that they are available now uh, for production. And then over the small tumors and over the large tumors, I think the standard operating procedures have been really important in, in establishing uh, a recipe that means that not everybody has to invent uh, everything uh, in order to get started. Uh, for the internal organs, uh, this is a little bit more diverse because you have uh, various specialities. You have the head and neck surgeons, you have the brain surgeons, you have you know all these people working in their respective fields and trying to use the technology for their uh, particular purpose. So it's going to be much more varied, um, but I think we're going to see electrochemotherapy come in 
uh, to a lot of different uh, specialities. And basically, the way I feel it's going to be is that you're going to have one generator or two at a hospital, and then uh, the various specialities will be able to use it with their electrodes. Calcium electroporation, I think, can be very important. Um, it's it, it, it will not be able to, in the same way, treat these huge tumors, not unless you do it step by step, but I think it can be hugely important for the small tumors, and it's going to simplify uh, the procedure because this means that the surgeons uh, are able to operate oncology-free. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'm, I'm uh, now closer to my pension than I am to my uh, uh, debut in oncology, so uh, um, I'm realizing that I'm, uh, I'm kind of handing off my job here. But I think it, it, will, it, will, it will make it much simpler if the surgeons are able to just do it in surgery. And calcium has a shelf life that, that's almost indefinite. Furthermore, up to 80% of the world's cancer per se patients live in countries where there are limited means for healthcare, and uh, I think also <coughs> that will mean that this could actually globally uh, become an important treatment. Gene therapy, I think, is also going to become very important. It will take some more years because you have a lot more work to do in terms of defining what are the optimal uh, vectors for the gene therapy and uh, 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 to design these and get them produced and get the studies done. Finally, I would mention that we have more information on the web uh, for the Center of Experimental Drug and Gene Electrotransfer, which I had. And we have also our patient brochure available in English. Please steal it and use as much as you want. Uh, I would mention that there's something new called ResearchGate, and I put all my papers there uh, so that they are, you can just download them. So. I mean, it's it's different. It's different how much access people have to different uh, journals depending on your institution. S and research gates allows you to just put it so that it can be downloaded. And then finally, of course, thanks to my group, uh, which has been a, a great inspiration uh, over the years. And and thanks also to my international collaborators. Uh, I think. Uh, I didn't manage to speak about that uh, today, but I think that the papers that we're doing now in, in international collaboration, I think, will be really important also in defining uh, the future of the technology. Thank you. Okay.